So good evening, everybody, and welcome to OTF Connects on this beautiful uh, sunsetty, at least in southern Ontario, evening of in March in Ontario. Uh, we're here together from right across the province to enjoy a session pre presented by Christina Jojewski from the Hamilton Wentworth Catholic District School Board on less input and more output, and she and I have been doing some preparatory work for tonight, and I'm pretty excited about this session. She's got some great ideas, very innovative, very creative, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Christina has uh, presented for OTF Connects before, and we're really happy to welcome her back. So Christina, I'm going to turn off my mic and turn things over to you. A warm welcome. Thank you so much, Susan, for that a really, really lovely welcome. And I want to thank everyone for coming and joining me tonight. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay um, and that my mic is working well. I found my other microphone. Um, so I'm just going to see here that we are good to go. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Susan. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, tonight, and I know I can't remember who had expressed uh, wanting to get all the links, but I am going to share with you right now that I have a place where I have put all of the links that I'll be talking about tonight, and that you can find at bit.ly forward slash less more OTF. Uh, you do have to use the capital letters on OTF to get to that site, uh, but that will bring you to a page that has every uh, sample that I'm talking about tonight, as well as some um, uh, short links to tutorial videos for some of the things that I can't show uh, or that some people might not need to see. So for those who want to see them, they can actually look at those tutorials later on when it comes to particular tools that we'll be talking about. Um, but what I do want to just uh, let you know that that will be available to you. I'm not going to be taking that down. So if you store that somewhere in your cloud, uh, you'll have access to all those resources. And if there's anything else you'd like to see, I have lots, loads more samples that I could share with you, but I just put on a few so that you had some ideas. So you can contact me at any time. Um, I have my email here that uh, you, can, you can send me a message or you can tweet and we can uh, connect that way. So um, thank you so much for joining me. I do apologize if you hear dogs in the background at any time. I do have two large dogs um, and I think my child should now be asleep. So my husband is putting her to sleep. So I do apologize if we have any background crying or barking or whining uh, that goes on through the session. Please bear with me. But um, I am an English teacher here in Hamilton. I'm, well, I'm in Hamilton right now. Uh, and I've been uh, teaching English for a number of years at St. Mary Secondary. And before that, I did teach ESL. So I do love teaching English, of course. But uh, this webinar, the tools that I'll be sharing with you, they're not necessarily new tools, but just better ways of, I think, or more efficient ways of using tools that we already know and perhaps love. And just to make your job a lot easier, maybe there might be a few things you can take away. Um, but generally, it's not that, uh, you know, it's, there are so many great tools out there. Um, it's just. I've tried to find, as I've gone through over the years, more efficient ways to use what I already know. And so that's what I'll be offering to you this evening. Um, and just to give you a bit of an overview, some of the ones that we will be talking about will be Edmodo. That's the online classroom that I enjoy using. I have used D2L, or what we call LMS at our school. Our board provides that. But I provide. I enjoy using Edmodo because it looks a lot like Facebook uh, and students that tend to know that are more familiar with it. It's a private, secure site that we'll talk about. Um, I'll also be talking about just using presentations like PowerPoint or Google for a lot of various purposes uh, that you might not think, uh, might not have thought of, or maybe you already are, and this will just confirm for you all the wonderful things you're already doing. Uh, and also how to use, you know, certain online tools just to give you better results, faster results, um, and get a, a better feel for those vulnerable students in your classroom. So that's what uh, we're looking to do tonight. And I guess what I want to talk about, you know, just a little bit first to set the framework is that I think what we're feeling more and more as teachers, and perhaps you agree, but um, I think every year it's becoming more and more challenging uh, to reach the students and get them comfortable in the classroom environment because uh, social anxiety is on the rise. This year in English, we found a huge problem with uh, having kids present. They're getting more and more afraid to present because of social anxiety that's coming from social media. Um, and I don't know if, I'm just wondering if people are finding that within their own classrooms that kids are becoming uh, more and more afraid to actually share or present. They're, they're happy to you know, type on a computer, but present in front of the class is becoming more and more of a problem. 
But uh, so what I'm thinking, you know, and what we've been dealing with, I think, even at our school and in my own classroom is we're just trying to get to these kids and, and support them while at the same time trying, you know, to, you know, manage our own time because there's just more and more that seems to be downloaded onto teachers each and every day. So uh, what I'm trying to cover here is how these tools maybe can just build efficiency into your, your time in terms of your lessons and maybe make them a little bit more accessible for everyone because if we're if we're being honest uh, we can't we can't always get to everybody we want to but depending on class sizes class sizes can be huge um, the needs are, are ranging and they're getting harder and harder to to get to everyone so hopefully these will help you to get to more students uh, in various ways and use what devices we do have access to because um, for example in one class I have access to one device or a few devices but in my other class I might have access to a whole lab so depending on where I am in the day my access changes and it, I think what's important is that as long as you have one tool or a couple of tools in the classroom or a few devices you can do a lot and so that's what we're going to look at. So I think that what is great about technology is that it can appeal to uh, all of those interests that our students, um, um, we can get them excited and they can share with us things that we wouldn't learn about them on a regular basis just by asking them to answer a question in class. Um, often we get the eager ones to answer but we don't hear from the, you know, the quieter students. So what's great is that it can take a lot of pressure off of us but it can also you know, pull on the students' strengths. So I just think it's important that we're able to have regular access of some sort, you know, not just, of course, the classroom computer that may be attached to the smart board, uh, but having students collaborate. And I will be talking about different ways to collaborate within this session um, because I think it's really important that we build that confidence. What I am finding this year is um, I'm involved in a, a project where I was able to get computers for, um, for 25 students, and it's a lab. But it was my, my proposal and why we were able to get them was because uh, I'm trying to get to the at-risk students who don't often have these devices available. I think we have this assumption that because they can scroll on their phone, um, they know how to use computers. And of course, we know that that's not true uh, once we see them using the, the devices. But what's also important is that we get them writing. And I think that uh, what we see is a lot of students on paper, as we know, they will be limited by the lines that are in a box, a text box, um, a table, and a lot of them have poor handwriting, struggle with spelling, lots of learning disabilities that actually stop them from answering a question on paper. But with text boxes, they actually are writing more, right? A text box expands, uh, the page expands online, so they're not thinking about how much I'm writing, it's just they're writing and they're letting it flow, so they're not as reluctant to answer. I think what's great about it too is that the students stop relying so much on the teacher and they won't think, okay, we're the only expert in the room and we have to look to them to give the answers all the time. They become more immersed and this is what I'm finding with different activities that I'm doing. Um, and we just become more of the facilitator. We can sit back and watch some amazing things happening while they're doing the, the, the learning and then eventually actually the teaching when we give them uh, the, the role, when we put that in their hands. So some of the things that I think help us to do more with less work, and that's what we're going to get to now, we're going to jump into some of these tools, is that, you know, we, we use a variety but confidently. And we, it's not that we have to have, you know, ten tools that we're using, but say we use three really well and really effectively. Um, surveys, online documents uh, can be used in so many different ways, and it can make discussion timely. We can give feedback to parents really, really quickly. And I'm going to show you an example of something that I'm doing that's a little different. Um, screencasts are incredible. I don't know how many of you already do screencasts. Maybe with a green check mark. How many people do screencasts in their class? Just take a, uh, a video of their lesson, not of themselves, but of your lesson and just post it on your online group. How many people maybe use that feature? So if you can just use a green check mark just so I get a kind of idea. So a couple people are using this. Um, I'm wondering, uh, not like sharing a Google Doc, but just uh, doing an actual screencast. So for example, if I were giving a PowerPoint presentation, um, you take a, a video of that with your voice and so that the students can go back and listen to your lesson. 
And I'm wondering what tools people are using to do that. You could do a smart notebook, yes. Um, there's also a lovely new tool in PowerPoint called Office Mix that lets you do this. Yep, Camtasia, uh, and even just a simple QuickTime recording of your screen. Yep, QuickTime on the Mac. That's one of the ones I use when I'm doing something from home. It's great. So if a lot of people are using that, and you've just gotten a lot of great ideas, if you notice in uh, your chat there from other people. Um, why I think this is so powerful, too, as many of you probably know, is that we have students who may not be following along the lesson the whole time uh, who need clarification. And it's really powerful when they can hear you explaining it uh, and look at those slides. But also I find um, I have a couple of students who are chronically absent for different reasons within my class, uh, whether it's illness or something else. And they're able to go on to our Edmodo classroom and catch up based on the simple screencast. It's really, it's not really any more work for us. It can be just seamless by capturing what you're already doing. So I just want to talk a bit about having an online classroom. And I don't want to spend too much time on this if everyone is already doing this. But if we could just get a, a green check mark or red X if you are already using an online classroom of some sort, whether it's the LMS or Edmodo, um, or maybe it's Google Classroom. Uh, Microsoft now has a classroom. Just a green check mark for those that are using it, or those who are not. OK, so it looks like a lot of people are. And I'm just wondering if you want to, OK, Moodle, I saw that. Thank you, Melissa, for that. If you wanted to maybe type in if there's something else other than the ones I mentioned that you might be using. Um, so Moodle was another one mentioned. And just as we're, as we're commenting here, what I, I mean, we already know all of this, and I don't need to, to say this to you, but it, we can't help but be supportive when we have an online classroom. Parents have one place to go to to reference everything that you're doing and to be able to help. I think it's more about being able to help their child um, when we're not available. And it's, I mean, there's a great article that I dropped into our set of links in the, uh, the OTF page that I, that I created there. But I mean, what's amazing is this educator here in this article that I posted um, says, you know, at the bottom here, imagine for a moment the pleasantry of having parents, you know, have the different tools at their fingertips. Um, and that, you know, you'd have more assignments being handed in, more consistency, a parent who can sit down and go through a lesson where there might be problems. Uh, yeah, we, so our school uses D2L. Uh, I love Edmodo, though, a little bit more than D2L just because of the, the layout. But I mean, there's so many, a lot of math uh, teachers at my school love D2L just for the way that they can post their lessons in math. And maybe it's because of English, but I love Edmodo. Um, but there's just you know different, different classrooms for, for different um, I think there's different appeals, but I think we, it's, it's invaluable at this point. I don't know that I could go without having an online classroom. So, I mean, just to give you an example in Edmodo, uh, there's a parent code that is available. As soon as your student joins, their parent will be informed, and there's a code that they would get so the parent can see in uh, on what their child is doing and what has or has not been handed in, which I love. So they would get an alert when uh, assignment has not been necessarily uh, handed in through um, text message. I don't know if anyone has questions about Edmodo, but I'm happy to answer them. I can pause for a moment. Um, is Edmodo part of a suite? No, it's completely free. Um, not everyone in my board uses Edmodo, and this is always the interesting conversation at school. Um, the board, there's no, there's no paying for it. It's actually free. Um, and thank you, Jason, for mentioning that. It, you can link it to both Google Drive or Office 365 right uh, on the side in Edmodo. It's quite lovely in that way, so your students can have all of their online documents um, attached right to their Edmodo account. So again, seamless work from cloud uh, to, to the Edmodo group. But, and it's private, right? So once you've had everybody join, you lock the classroom, and no one else can access it. So it's great in that you have that privacy aspect. You have that confidence. Students can message you. Um, they can collaborate with other students. And I love small groups in Edmodo. I don't know if anyone else uses small groups in Edmodo, but I can actually break off you know, students into small groups. They can work on a project all within our Edmodo classroom. And so they're you know, just by themselves with six, and I can see everything that's going on um, in smaller groups. So there's a lot of flexibility with Edmodo. Um, and it's, I think, um, it can send, yes, so it's like Remind in that you have to send 
or sign up for the alert. There's it's a really quick little, it says either send email alerts or text message alerts. And so parents and, and students would get messages to their phone when something is due or when I post something, whether it's an assignment or a, a notice, uh, they'll get that. Does anyone have any other questions about Enmodo? So one of the other things I like about it is when I post, say, a slideshow, this is a slide right from my, uh, one of my writing slideshows. Um, it's, yeah, oh, and I love, Jason just mentioned, I do this all the time. I post my lessons the day before or the night before, set a time for it, and then by, like, I'll say 8.30 because class starts at 8.30, then those will come up only at 8.30 a.m. the next day or, say, um, for my next period class. So I can actually set the times that the uh, notes will appear or a quiz will appear. And you can actually do quizzes in Edmodo. There's lots of polling features there. But what's great is that uh, you have control of when you want to post. And you could just pre-plan your lessons and just set the times and, and be done with it. Um, and you don't have to be posting every single night. Oh, Laura, thank you for sharing that. So Google, I, I'm not as familiar with Google Classroom um, because we're not a GAPE school. But uh, yes, that, looks, that sounds wonderful. So it sounds like you can also do that in Google Classroom if you are using that currently. That's wonderful. So what I do just as like a quick, um, and I'll get back into presentations in a moment, but this is just a slide from one of my PowerPoints. What's great is that when parents and students can access your slideshows, um, I do things like building in live links here. So you would see, if you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse over here, but in the right, on the right side there, the green bubble, um, what they, all they have to do is click here and they would actually get to my rubric. Um, so then if they forget the rubric at, at school, and this is, you know, the paper problem, but this is why I always post my notes or handouts on Edmodo for anything that might have gotten lost along the way, right, or doesn't quite make it home. So there's always a, a safe, safety net there because a lot of times students have actually even had to maybe say print it because they forgot something. Nobody's stuck when we're using paper in the classroom rather than just being paperless. So there's always a, a go-to when you can build things into your slideshows and post them on your online classroom. The other thing too, as of course, is you can make uh, your ex instructions extremely explicit and uh, you know that they can go back and view that and click right within their slides. Oh, thank you, Susan. Yeah, I was trying to get the, <laughs> I don't know why my pointer doodle is not coming up here. Okay. Oh, I think I, all righty. There it is. Let's see if it's, no. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So <laughs> there is my pointer tool. So I think what's really important about um, streamlining your content, being able to put a lot of your class content online is that it's going to help, I mean, it's, it's definitely going to, number one, help you. Uh, I find that helps me as a teacher. I feel more confident uh, knowing I have my go-to place for everything when I go into class um, and that my students have access all of the time and that I can really, I actually let the tools morph as I go through lessons. We'll add things on the spot. Um, I'm not afraid to, you know, let students be adding to our slideshows and we'll talk more about collaboration um, later on. So I think it's really important for them to have the ability to collaborate regularly. So pretty much every day in my classroom, uh, students are adding their responses or their findings into our lessons. So the lessons become live and they evolve as we go. Um, like I already talked about, screencasts are hugely important uh, to giving them and building independence, right? For those who miss steps, need a refresher, are absent, um, perhaps did not get it when I heard, said it the first time. And then it saves you from repeating your lesson three, four times uh, within, the, within the day. And then, of course, I want to talk, um, I will be talking a lot about Google Forms uh, because I think they are just such a powerful tool for, for various reasons. Um, I really, really love the, um, um, oh, QuickTime screencast. Sorry, I'm just seeing Zach's comment on the side there. Yes, uh, you can, you will get an audio recording um, if you have your, if your mic is on. So if you are talking, so I actually have a sample of a recording I did for my class in our uh, links there. So if you look under screencasting, you'll see just like a quick one I did about how to hand in a document online. Um, but it will, and I just use my Mac to do that. It took me about 30 seconds, I think, to do that. So I just want to talk about how we can all gain some uh, opportunities by getting our students to collaborate building their independence, and of course, who doesn't want more efficient marking? So we'll talk a bit about, more about that as we go through. 
So, I mean, I just want to talk quickly about Google Slides. I, I am going to say that my, my presentation is heavily Google-based because I do love Google, and the reason is because it's free uh, for students. I, we are not a gay school, like I said, um, but we, I've always loved Google, and my board is actually Office 365, so I'm, I don't want to say like I'm a lone, you know, wolf here, but I, I just go ahead and use Google because I think it's really powerful for students to always have access. I know that once they leave our school, um, they'll lose those Office 365 accounts, and I, and I think it's really important that they have really strong um, control of online tools before they leave us and can continue that with a professional account of whatever it looks like. So I have them build an account right off the bat. So I am going to be talking a lot about Google, uh, but all of these, of course, uh, or sorry, most of these uh, tools are in Office 365 and in other places. So I try to pair um, my samples with, I have a link to Office things inside my uh, that list of links that I gave you. So. Just if you're curious, we can always talk about office uh, options. So one tool that some of you may not know of, or maybe you have used, and I'd love to hear some feedback on what you're thinking about it, is Google just added a presenter view feature. So when you're in your slideshow, you can post, you can change it over to presenter view, and it will generate this link, as you can see here at the top. Um, so this link will then give students the chance to ask questions during your presentation that only you will see. So imagine not having to have students put their hand up or having to speak out. What an amazing opportunity. And this has actually prompted some amazing discussion in my classroom when students I know are too afraid to ask. And they, you know, they don't want it. We know this, right? We, the kids don't want to sound silly. And I'm talking more about high school. Um, they lose that confidence, unfortunately, as, we, as they get older. Um, they don't want to take as many risks is what I find, especially with my senior kids. Um, so what it is, a, it is a really fantastic tool, and I have a quick few slides just to show you what that would look like if you were to use it. Um, so what would happen, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back for a second here. And that's going to, I have more on this uh, coming up in just a second. Oh, I think my slides are out of order. Oh, no. Nope, that's okay. So I'm going to carry on here. So what would happen, um, and I have it coming up in just a second. Uh, poll everywhere, yeah, it's similar, but this is nice because it's based on your slides, so you can see your slide content in presenter view, and you see the, the questions up on the screen as well. So you're going to see both slides at the same time. Um, and students then will actually start, you know, as I said, speaking up here. So here's what, if I've got them here, this is what it looks like. It's really, really simple. Um, in Google Slides, you just click present and under there there's a little drop down menu that you can see here on my screen and you just click present review. That's it. Um, there's no extra work involved. It's already built into whatever slideshow you've already made on uh, Google Slides. So what, what you'll see is this screen here and when you click on start new it will generate that link for your students. So your students would see um, this link and it actually comes across um, let me just click over here. So they'll see this in the top bar. It actually uh, hovers on your slideshow throughout the whole slideshow. So it doesn't go away, and they will always have um, access to, on, so they can use their phone to ask a question. They can use the computers that they have in front of them if you have um, like a lab out booked out. So uh, it's, no, no, so it's only live. This is when you're presenting live. It wouldn't be after the fact. So to answer Alana's question there on the side. Um, it's, it's wonderful, though, so it's only for when you're actually presenting. Um, if you, not for, say, if you're delivering online content, um, like an e-course. E so then what your students would see is this. Um, and until anyone starts asking questions, they won't see anything here. Then you would, they would see. Uh, they would have these options, sorry. So they can ask a question as themselves, and so that's where you see my name there, or they can actually ask it anonymously. So it just gives them a little bit more freedom, but you will notice that they have a character limit, which is good. So this ha helps out the teacher because while you're delivering your lesson, you can look at their question, it is a little bit uh, more streamlined. You can look at their questions and answer as you go, or you can go back and address them after you're done your, your lesson, your presentation, whatever it is. So it's a really neat feature. Um, I didn't know if I caught in the chat, but did anyone, is anyone using this at this time, the uh, presenter tool? If you want to 
Zach, how are you finding it? I don't know if you wanted to jump on the mic or if you want to just uh, post in the chat. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Maybe how you're finding it. Yes. Awesome. Um, I yeah, I've been using it for the past year since it since it rolled out, and I find it incredibly helpful. The one thing I was actually going to uh, type in the chat box was that I find it's a really great um, tool to also reinforce this idea of, of tech etiquette, like tech etiquette. Because you're, anytime your students can ask anything anonymously, especially in a high school context in like grade nine and ten, you're always going to have those, you know, kind of awkward, funny moments where someone writes something inappropriate. And so I think it's a, it's a good. You just want to keep that in mind. It's a good opportunity to talk about how you can use tools, tech tools, uh, in a, a way that's productive. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. I did uh I should have mentioned yes, the that bit is really important um before we start anything and I know in, and this happens every semester for me in high school. I have to start from like the beginning or like scratch with uh in terms of etiquette because they get silly. Um even in uh Google anything we're doing in presentations, they quickly find the chat feature and they they can be ridiculous. So it's really important that um they use uh that we talk about netiquette right from the beginning. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, the thing too is what I have to always impress upon them is that, you know, you're at risk of losing the devices or access to this technology. We need to be responsible digital citizens because this is something we have to use uh, a lot in our classroom and you want to have access to that. So that's something that we definitely have to talk about and I thank you so much for bringing that up and uh, that sharing the mic there. Thank you. Would it work in a junior classroom? I think so. I think absolutely. And of course, like we just said, talking about netiquette first. But in the junior classroom, yes, especially even I would think in like if you want to do it in small groups or if you had access to enough devices that they could ask their questions. I think it's super powerful for those those younger kids to be able to ask these questions um, while you're presenting. And I guess, you know, maybe it ha might have to be at a at a you know chunked and slower pace in terms of what it might be that they're focusing on, but absolutely, I think that that would be a great tool for them. Yeah, maybe a mini lesson. Sorry, the chat's happening very quickly for me, so I'm trying to keep up with that and uh, the presentation here. So if I don't if I don't answer your question, please feel free to repost or try to put your hand up, get my attention with a little uh, hand up tool so that I can. I don't want to miss anybody here. And if you want to know more about that, we can go back and talk about presenter review. But I did drop in a link in our uh, links page. So I just want to talk about why I think PowerPoint, um, something as simple as PowerPoint or Google Slides, can be so powerful in an efficient way in terms of helping us as teachers and helping our students. I mean, what I, I know just for myself, I use slides to have students collaborate within the slides. I post the slideshow, I add the slides, they get in there, they edit the content, they have tasks, very pointed tasks where they have to put you know, certain information in there. And, and this helps build confidence in creating slides, in sharing information, in presenting information. It's an instant presentation where we can do informal little uh, presentations and have them speaking. The more they speak, the more confident they get for those presentations. Um, and so that's really, really important that uh, they're doing this. I put all the links into my handouts in there, whether it's just a rubric or an interactive handout that we actually modify and present in class. Um, I embed videos all of the time into my slides. It's really quick for teaching. It's great for reinforcement, um, even for quizzing my class notes, my questions with student responses, and I also actually embed quiz links into the end of a lesson. So if we are doing online, I would um, uh, have them go, that quiz is right there at the end of the lesson and they, they, it takes them right to my Google form quiz. So it really does streamline the process. I'm not handing out papers uh, necessarily um, and I've got them, you know, it's, everything is right there for them. So for example, I teach Shakespeare, which a lot of kids are afraid of. Uh, so I start off with a nice TED Ed lesson. I love TED Ed for those of you, I'm sure a lot of you are using them, but they're fantastic in that they illustrate, uh, they're animated, and they talk about some really big topics um, in, in a more engaging way for students. So you know, just building in something as simple as a YouTube video, um, it's seamless with Google Slides. I mean, it, it, 
really is easy to do, but just so effective in being able to show everything that you have. You're not clicking in and out of different areas. Um, here's an example where I have the slide here. When we're talking about Romeo and Juliet, um, I actually build in the handouts right to my pages in my, in my slideshow, and students are taken, they have to, uh, to those pages pages so that they can then go back and reference our, our work. And it's really, it takes me only a second to link my handouts, but now they have a tool uh, where they're going and doing the work and then sharing the work in, within the same, within the 75 minute period, we've done everything. So really, it's just about making our slides work for us. Um, here's another example. I will explicitly state my instructions and then give them the link to what I want them to complete. Teaching them, this is uh, one of the slides I used. This was uh, just from the beginning of the semester for the second semester here, um, teaching my students how to, um, you know, just use Google Docs or Office 365 to create their online binder. And so, you know, simple instructions, clicking on a link, making a copy, saving it to your drive, because truth be told, I found very quickly that a lot of my grade 11s and 12s don't have confident use in just using the cloud. So we, you know, it's really important and it's becoming more and more important um, for us to teach them how to use these tools because they're not getting it in every class. Uh, at high school, it's really, really tough because um, it's really scattered, right? Different access in different classrooms. So it's really important that, you know, we do teach them how to use these tools and then it helps all of us become more effective. Something simple like um, for me, I always found it hard to get students, and I still find it hard to get students writing on paper. So when I can, um, I did something here where I had them submit topic sentences as practice. And I was able to do this through a Google form. So it could be um, showcase your knowledge of whatever content you're teaching, whether it's history, geography, science, um, math equations, because you can do these in Google Forms, um, and seeing how testing, do they understand the lesson? Um, and then I'm able to see it all in a spreadsheet. So so quick, it's right there in my slideshow. Um, really, it's all about streamlining. And I was able to take the information, and here it is. I took, all I did was copy and paste from my form some sample uh, topic sentences, and I was able to do it in the next lesson, show them these are the ones that worked well. They were able to move on to uh, the next process in the writing, or next stage, rather, in the writing process. And I didn't have to do any extra legwork. I wasn't collecting papers. I was able to just simply copy and paste from a tool that they had used that day. So I want to talk about, uh, to just to remind you, for those of you who are using, and I'm sure most of you, this is probably an obvious, um, are proficient users of PowerPoint or Google Slides. But remember that your lesson can easily be redone by making a copy of it. Share the new link with your next semester or your class next year. What's nice about these slideshows is that you don't have to redo them or reinvent lessons. It's simple uh, for us as making a copy and sharing the next year's, you know, with the next year's class. Of course, we always modify our content, but the lessons, the content, the, uh, the structure rather is there, right? Whether it's, you know, Shakespeare doesn't change, for example. So it's what we do with it is what matters. So I just want to pose a couple of questions for you. I'm very lucky, like I said, I was uh, lucky to win a bid for computers in my one class, and so I'm really trying to focus on what a paperless classroom would actually look like in my one, uh, just my one grade 11 college class. So I started thinking, like, what if a binder wasn't the obstacle for students? Because a lot of my college students, I find, you know, struggle with um, just keeping organized, and this is all students, uh, but my college students were having struggle, you know, time with keeping binders organized losing handouts, not finishing handouts, um, leaving them blank, right? All they suddenly get lost in, in a desk and they, they lose them and never come back to them. But what if you could just share and how amazing would it be if you could track homework? And I like, you know, homework in quotations there because, you know, and it might not necessarily be homework, but work that we do in class and show parents how their, their kids are doing. Often we can't do this with a binder because students will hide them, say I lost it or I don't know. But what I did was, um, I did something simple, and it seems very, very straightforward, but I took a Google Doc and I turned it into 
a live document for students to share with me. So I'm calling it a work tracker. Um, and so it's really just a living document where students are sharing with me all of their work in one place. So I don't have them handing in multiple things on Edmodo anymore. Um, one time they share this link for a unit of study, and then they put in all the work that they do into that one page. So what it ended up looking like was uh, this is like that. There's no excuses, really. It just makes it no excuse. Um, and so what it looked like simply for me was I have them, I give them instructions on Edmodo, they turn it in one time, and this is just a recent example here, but uh, they, they, I call it a work tracker. They fill in, they hand it in one time, and then this is what I gave them as a template. So they get this template, and here are the various lessons on the left side. Um, those are the titles of, for the work that I would be giving them. And this changes, so whatever you're doing, if it's a science unit, and it's unit one, unit two, unit three, a lab, what have you, um, then I add as we go, if I have other exercises, but on the right side is the important side, the exciting side for me. Uh, and what it becomes is a living document where all of their work, uh, they can see how much they're actually accomplishing. And I, it's funny because I know it seems so simplistic, but them seeing it in front of them, rather than just a binder with pages after page after page, um, it's somehow been, it's been working really well in our classroom. Um, I have kids doing more work than they've, they've done before, and I don't know if it's just because they can see everything. Um, so all I do is make a Google file, simple thing, right? Make a Google Doc. I teach them how to make a copy of it, and then my work is done because they save it, and then it ends up looking like this. So this is one of my students' uh, trackers right now. And so I can now actually go in, and where, you know, with 28 students, in one period, let's say, I wouldn't be necessarily able to see all of their binders all the time. But now they're responsible, and I'm able to actually see what they've completed. I can send this link to their parents. Um, their parents can see this one sheet with one click. This is what they've completed. This is what's not done. And they can actually click on each link and look at their handouts, whereas a binder just doesn't give us that kind of power or um, opportunity to see what's going on. So I'm just wondering if people are using docs like this and in, in other ways, um, creating, making them into more of a living document online that, that parents can access. So just for me, it was like an aha moment where I could give kids more control and, and our, myself, actually, because I could see what they were doing on a more regular basis. Um, and I will tell you, I will share this just because I think it was pretty amazing for me. Um, this this year, or sorry, this this semester recently, we had a um, what was I going to say? Sorry, but a, uh, a an assignment, a paragraph due, and I have 28 students in this one class. 12 of them are IEP'd. 26 actually submitted them, and so for on the first try, this was a rare occasion. Um, it made it like 93% success for me was a win. It was a huge win when. When I, and I know it's based on access, but this really um, became, you know, a big eye opener. When we can give them access for a certain assignment, it doesn't have to be all assignments, but what a huge difference it made that I had 26 complete on time or before the due date. And before was phenomenal for me. So I think, you know, the answers can become richer. So not only is it, oh, sorry. Oh, I can provide more. Yes, I can. I'm going to go back then for, let me just go back a slide here. So all I did, uh, Nicole, was I created a Google document, just a doc, and I created a chart for them. So this was my, this slide here just shows the template. And I, I'm really big on changing color and backgrounds. It just seems to change kids uh, when they don't see a white screen, I don't know why, but it seems to work. It has a little bit more appeal, so I often use color in my backgrounds. I know it's a simple thing. So all they have to do is make a copy and share it. That's it. Yep, one time. They make a copy, share the link, and then I have constant access to that file, which keeps getting updated as they work through whatever assignment it is that they complete. This could work for just having, you know, handing in assignments from home. So it doesn't have to be, they're adding, yes, these are the links to their own documents. And those documents are always, um, samples that I make and they again make a copy and just put it into the into the tracker there. So those are all my handouts uh, made into work. They're worksheets online essentially or any online content we're doing. Does that help? So um, digital, yeah, so in my own drive or in their own drive, they can share their whole file folder. But what I like about having it all in a worksheet space is that it shows them um, 
it's a reminder for them. It's like a visual reminder, like, okay, I have work that I haven't completed yet, or, oh, I did this really well. So it's just always in their face, I find, uh, when they're looking at that one place, rather than say it like a, a set of files in their file folder or in a portfolio. I know it's just something that, that's working well for them right now, um, but this is just my one approach. Have you used digital portfolios, or have you had any good experiences? Anyone want to share perhaps a... I'll just wait to see if there's, I think Nicole is typing there. So while Nicole is um, responding there, I just want to talk about how, oh, trying in math. Oh, excellent. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice to hear. Yeah, so I mean, this is, I'm coming from, of course, an English perspective, but some of the things I will show, um, I do have, I want to talk about drawings and how that's, of course, for math, drawings are great, so we'll talk about Google Drawings, but yeah, I think a tracker could just be great. Um, yeah, and as Elena's saying, right, they're best selections. So for me, because I have access in that one class all the time, I'm having them hand in, and I don't mark everything. It's not about marking everything, but that they're aware of, of those uh, units of the and the work that they're doing so that they can go back, use them for studying, um, or then for what I am marking, so I have instant access to it. So whatever it is I'm using it for, all the work is there. It's, it's all um, accessible for me and it's easily accessible for their parents and for themselves. So something simple that I do with to Google Docs too, um, probably a lot of you already do this, is um, I use, I'll make them use living, or sorry, live links rather to important content that will pick up on an idea. So for example, in my 3C class, we read a story, or the story of King Midas, uh, and in the short story, I have them make a real world connection to connections to different uh, people or corporations and what was nice this year was to see that they are accessing you know up to date um, content and then they're making rich and meaningful connections more than if I had had them just do this on paper. This is always a struggle for, for uh, a lot of students when it's just on paper. Um, and it was really nice to see that I could take something as simple as a Google Doc and, and it really um, motivated them more. So here's an example just from just one small example and it may not seem like a big deal to you but for this student it was because he is a vulnerable student in my class. He made a great uh, connection between Donald Trump and uh, King Midas, right? So this is a student who does not often speak in my class, uh, doesn't put out a lot of output and he did a great job. I think it really showcased that, you know, just because he's not talking or often engaging uh, verbally with the class, that he has a lot of great, you know, ideas to share. So I really, if it was really powerful, you know, some, such a simple activity became powerful because it was, you know, online. And it let me hear more of his voice than I've heard before. And, you know, something, it's not about reinventing. I think that's, you know, we always think we have to put so much into reinventing and, you know, spend hours creating content, but why not just take a simple, it could just be as simple as a handout that you do give and taking a screenshot of it uh, and making it into, you know, workable content online. So here's a really simple one, a silly one that we do in my uh, Shakespeare grade, this is grade 11, Merchant of Venice, my U university class. This is, you know, act one, scene one of, of not Merchant of Venice, sorry, Romeo and Juliet. And, you know, they're filling in content here and what just looks like a little uh, graphic becomes, um, we can then put text into it on the smart board, capture it into our notes, and here they are, right? Here's the work that they did. These are their quotations. And so now I know, I can see, I have evidence that they're engaging with the, the lesson with Shakespeare, you know, a very daunting uh, task for them with the language, but they've, they've done it and we've captured this moment and we now can, they have this in their notes. So, you know, it's a simple thing. It can be something as simple as a piece of paper that becomes um, an online living, breathing document. And I know that doesn't seem highly sophisticated, but, you know, it's, it's something that we can capture with a document camera or a cell phone or an iPad camera uh, and then really it shows them, right, with their visual, this is what they've done, this is what they can be proud of. Um, so in a more sophisticated, you know, uh, way, um, I recently, you know, because again, like I said, I had more access, I took a lesson that I would have done on paper in, over multiple days and turned it into different um, activities. And so what was really amazing to me was that I was able to 
help the visual learner, the auditory learner, the students with uh, a lot of learning disabilities and exceptionalities when it came to either vision, processing, speed, reading, um, and all really efficiently for both me and for the students because um, here are just some of the different ways that you know this one unit worked. Um, I had a visual assignment through Google Drawing, which I absolutely love. What a powerful free tool. I had a dramatic reading of the story just as an MP3 that I found online. Quick link through that in there for them in the online classroom. And we had, uh, I did something as simple as taking the story of the Telltale Heart, that's the story that I'll be talking about, and I put it into a bigger font and did contrast on the background in Google Docs. It's so simple, but it really um, was powerful. So, for example, I'll show you here what that unit looked like over the week. It was one week and multiple applications. So, and I will show what a screen grab of that looks like, but I took the story, like I said, put it into a doc, um, made the text larger, contrasted black on, white on black writing, so I was able to help. And all the kids actually found it more beneficial to read in this way. Um, so a very simple thing. And they were able to copy and paste information right out of the Google Doc text. Um, and I linked the text right with the audio. It was right embedded into our story. Uh, we had a lesson on context clues that I'll show you, where they were able to explore difficult language, you know, simple thing like definitions, right, that they could look up quickly. Um, and, and I don't know if you've read The Telltale Heart, but the language is highly elevated. Um, and I did this with my, my grade 11 college class because it, it is a great story. It's, um, it's pretty horrific, but uh, it got them engaged and interested very, very quickly. So they had the buy-in there. Um, then we were able to look at you know something like a plot graph that never gets filled in on my class, right, if I just give them pen and paper. Uh, had a lot, a lot more buy-in that way. Inferencing, huge. Had students doing a visualization, which I will show you. I think that it turned out really well for them um, when they had, you know, just a simple tool to, to use as a template. And then I was able to, on the final day, of course, kids love when there's a movie attached. Uh, there was a short film on the Telltale Heart, 20 minutes, embedded it right into our lesson. I was able to then, this was great as reinforcement before we did a quick uh, 10 mark quiz on the story to reinforce their learning, and I did that in Google Forms. And the quiz, uh, because I set it up, it marked itself, and they were able to see their feedback automatically. So one text, everyone uh, had access. So some, this is something simple, right? This is a text with um, that that just changing the, the writing from that white screen to the black background, white text. Simple thing to do in Google Docs when you um, click on the page setup. You can change the background color of your page. So that's where this became really useful. I was able to, this is my handout that on paper wouldn't have had much power, but I was able to take a traditional handout, link it right to the text, so a short link to my story text, and a link to the audio, and then they were able to uh, like I said, just look up definitions, right? So once they had done, you know, the, the context clues part, then they had a chance to just quickly do uh, a search in Google, right, right within the document. No having to look in multiple pages, and that's why I love that, that quick tool uh, in Google under Explore, which I'm sure many of you are already using. Um, just another example, right? Plot diagram became um, easier to use. I can post my graphic of my text, of my information. Now here's where I found it really, really uh, powerful. So something that, you know, students, when we just read a story in class and have them do work, or whether it's, you know, a lesson in history and have them do a handout, um, by being able to take something as simple as a template that I made, this was just a template I created in Google Drawing, took me probably five minutes, um, then I had these kinds of results. So I'll show you what some of the students created for me from this very basic, uh, I just wanted them to find four quotations that showed that the narrator uh, descends into madness. And then they had to have four different visuals that showed that change. And this is what I got from, and these I chose these students because they are often less engaged. But, and here's what I got. And what was really neat to see was that everyone was working on this. It was quiet in the class. Kids were doing all, like they were asking me how to do different features in Google Drawing. They wanted to know how to change different things. They really wanted to make this their own. And what's funny is I just wanted to do this as a, a practice. And then right away they said, Miss, well, you're going to mark this, right? They were so proud of their work that they wanted me to mark it. And I said, okay, 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 but I have to show you some kind of rubric. I can't just mark it. But I, I was thrilled that 
they they were so proud of their work uh, that they wanted they wanted me to give it some it had to have a mark it had to have value and so here's another example uh, there is I, all of them turned out so well um, so the student here matched up the words that highlighted uh, their visual or what their visual was trying to highlight rather in the in the quotation so really really simple but a very powerful tool and it really illustrates their understanding uh, and it was something that they enjoyed doing and then of course as I said um, I linked it to the video the next day and then which was then linked to a Google quiz and I love Google forms because they are just so powerful they give you a lot of information back with a not not a lot of work and I will talk about those in just a moment so like I like I said what was what I was able to accomplish because I had those tools in in my pocket were they now know the story elements they know how to create content online they are proud of the work that they created and now moving forward in our course they can use those skills so now we're just building on those skills as we go through so I'm going to stop and see if anybody has any questions before I move on to Google drawings so if anyone I don't know if anyone has that, or wants to maybe you know comment on maybe one of those tools that they're using in their classroom in a way that that uh, might benefit everyone in the group here listening if there's something that you want to share like perhaps a uh, you know a tool that works well for you. Uh, are people familiar with Google Drawing? Have you used Google Drawing? So maybe just with a green check mark, are you using Drawing or have you? Uh... So green check mark if you use Drawing or have used Drawing or red if you've not used it before. Oh, you can't hear. Can you hear me now? Can everyone hear me okay? Sorry. I think I lost connection there. Sorry, I was, and I was commenting on Jason too, uh, the test quizzes. Yeah, no, I use, I use Google Form quizzes. I don't uh, use Edmodo quizzes as much. I don't like them. Um, Google Forms I just find is a lot better because I can give my students feedback, um, and, and it's right away. It's instantaneous. So sorry about the silence there, guys. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, Google Drawing and just talking about just, you know, how powerful this tool could be for us. And for those of you who are using it for math or science, it, there, are, um, there are some great add-ons in this tool and you can export them as something called scalable vector, well, scalable vector something. I'm sorry, but I have no clue what that is. But it seems like a very useful thing uh, for graphing. So there's a, there's some great components for, for subject areas here. It's, it, this can be a really great tool. And again, it's free. And just for a little bit of fun here, for those of you getting you guys back on uh, track here, if you want to know how to draw Justin Timberlake using Google Drawings, I threw in a link. So if you are teaching art, um, there are ways that you can create these kinds of drawings in Google Drawing, so I I think it's amazing, um, and so that link is there for you if you want to explore that further. Uh, there's a gentleman who goes into detail in his tutorial, but wow, right? This is I mean a free tool, so if you are interested, uh, check that out. I like to use it for things like this: graphic organizers, right? Really powerful uh, graphic or organizers. When we are again going back to King Midas. Um, Something simple, that, so I showed you the one about the telltale heart just a moment ago. This one is for King Midas. Um, when we were looking at the climax of the story, they had to find moments of suspense in the story. And, um, you know, just to kind of add interest and, and get their attention back on track, I put in sometimes little uh, gifts that, uh, you know, add some, just some interest, right, some moving pictures when, when possible. Um, and, you know, sometimes, into my slideshows as well, just to see that they're paying attention, right? Um, but you know, they like to have fun with it too in their presentations. They start using GIFs in their uh, presentations, so when they are used well, uh, they can have a, a nice effect to them. But what I think um, is great about, sorry, I'm gonna go back for a second to Google Drawings is you have so much control over what the final product looks like, and it can look really 
professional. Um, I've just shown you some simpler ones, but in past OTF presentations, I showcased uh, some of my student work. They use this for magazine covers, and you can get a lot out of Google Drawing. Um, they don't have to be experts in like Photoshop and have access to Photoshop, which you know they have to you know pay for. This is this is free. So you know if you want more about Google Drawing. Um, let me know, but it is a fantastic, fantastic tool that I just find really exciting that you know it is something that we can access for free. So I am going to move on to Google Forms, which uh, springs off of Jason's last comment, though. Yeah, I love Google Forms because um, if you're not a form user, you uh, what's really lovely is that after each question or within each question, you can give students feedback on why they got the answer wrong. So you can embed that feedback uh, into the wrong answers so that when they go back and look at the right answers, there's a, you can choose this tool or the, sorry, choose this option in Google Forms. Uh, it's instant for them. So they're not waiting for you to mark a paper quiz. Uh, they're not waiting for you to tell them why they got it wrong. They'll see right then and there, and it's, it's so valuable. And it's really not a lot of work once you set it up. So, I use, um, sorry, I'm going to go back for a second. I use forms for not just a quiz, uh, that's one nice feature, uh, but I use it for testing prior knowledge, right? Asking, you know, for agree or disagree statements to see where the class is at, and then it sparks discussion, um, self-reflection, and I don't know if people have done this before, but I use it for peer editing. So I can actually create a form, and students can do peer editing when I link the, the group's content to my form. So if you have students, you know, looking at each other's slideshows, let's say, um, or some, some other content that they've created, um, like Nicole said, perfect, um, the, with Google um, Forms, you can put in a video, you can put in an image, so if you had, say, a lesson or even like, it could be something that you drew in class or a snapshot or something from a field trip, you can put them right into your form and then have a question on that. Um, so it's, there's, the possibilities are endless for what you can do with these forms. Um, and because it's online, it's, it's incredible. Um, yes, Laura, I'd love to uh, talk more about Google Drawing. Uh, perhaps we could do it in another session because it's really, there's a lot. It's really, really rich, and there's a lot of, uh, I, if I have time at the end, though, I can take you through a quick tour of Google Drawing. We can do an application share, so I'd be happy to do that. So just um, talking about uh, Google Forms and some of the reasons I love them is you can assign a point value uh, to each question, and yeah, like I said, it's self-marking. You can randomize. So if you're worried about, I know we're always worried about, you know, students cheating or whatever. Uh, so it will randomize the order so that if you are in a situation where students are side by side, that helps a little bit. Uh, it's nice that you can shuffle them. And then what's great is in one spreadsheet or on an individual snapshot, you can see how the student did. And if you really wanted to, you could screenshot it, I suppose, um, and show the student, you know, or parent, this is how, you know, Alex did, he got, you know, 10 out of 10, and here's a, a snapshot of his work. Um, so it's neat in that you can always go back and uh, share that information with the students. But they'll also see their mark right after the quiz is done, if you allow it. You don't have to. So you don't have to um, give them access to those right or wrong answers. That could be something that's shared after the fact. Um, so here's an example of what you can gain from it. So here in, in this question, I just took a screenshot of uh, one, of the, one of the questions here. In the bar graph, it will show you um, where people are at. So this is great for, you know, maybe your next lesson for the next day. Maybe kids didn't understand something as well as you thought. Maybe you need to go back and, and look at a concept or a question in more detail. Um, so really, really quickly, with, you know, 28 students, I'm going to go back to my 3C class again, but, or here, there were 27 there that day. Um, the 27 students, only 20 of them, if you can see that, it's pretty tiny, but only 20 of them got it correct. So perhaps it's something I need to review uh, as an example. And that um, is self-generated by Google Forms. Um, another example. Here in the, in the top, it told me, um, or this is just a screen capture, like I was talking about that quiz, it will show you what the student's mark is. So if you're going to put this into your mark book, you can throw in, you know, you'll know right away, okay? I just asked them for first name and last initial in terms of uh, collection to keep it, you know, kind of uh, safe there. But then I've got the mark right there. It was very, very quick for me. But here's something lovely about... Um, Sorry, it's coming out from here. There it is. Um, I can see very, very quickly how the class did overall. 
So I know that the average score, you know, on average, the students understood that uh, that concept that I was testing um, and where they fall in terms of uh, correct response or responses. So I like that it shows me that distribution really, really quickly. And for those of you who are using forms or, or who are not as, as uh, are not as knowledgeable about forms, it's really simple. When you're in uh, Google Forms, there are already blank quizzes set up. You can use these for all kinds of different things. Um, I've used them for, like I said, agree or disagree questions. You can use them for a bake sale at your school, um, perhaps like for you know gathering information on any kind of activity. Um, these are great for that. But uh, just some examples. Prior knowledge, I, I have a unit in my grade nine, academic. Um, talking about heroes. So you can see some, for example, what makes a hero, and I'm able to embed a little video that they can watch, another TED Talk here, on what makes a hero, have them name a movie, and then if this, I project onto the screen the answers, which were anonymous, um, and so we can get a discussion started. The kids start talking about, oh, I love that movie, or, you know, oh, I've seen that, and they talk about the hero's journey, and we have them look at how it follows the hero's journey structure. But this, this simple, quick form, get some talking, get some involved. Um, and just, you know, example of what the responses could look like. You know, we've got the Hunger Games, Superman, Captain America. And you can see that, you know, 26 people actually participated, whereas if I were to ask this question, I might get two kids that yell out an answer of a movie title. So, you know, something, something so simple. Um, when we were talking about peer editing, what I've done in the past when I taught Harry Potter in my grade 9 class last year, they had to create, in their four houses, they had to create uh, a slideshow. So this was to get them practicing for their culminating presentations. But I was able to get the four groups to edit each other's slideshows and give them feedback. Simple thing. I took the link to their group slideshow. I had a Google form. I made four copies of it, so I didn't have to do this four times. I made a copy, dropped in the link, and then they had to go through and evaluate. Was this section effective? Uh, was this section effective? You know, what could they have done better? And then all I did was I shared that information, the spreadsheet link with those groups, and they got instant feedback uh, from their peers. And it was it was organized, and it was there was a lot more information than they might have put on paper or just said to each other. You know, saying, "Oh yeah, it looks good." Uh, there was a lot more that they gave back to their peers in this way. So really, really powerful for peer editing. I love forms for that. And then I personalized it a little bit because I had time. Um, but I personalized, you know, at that moment I really was uh, invested in these guys because I wanted them, in, you know, interested in the lessons and uh, in giving each other feedback. So I personalized their houses. You know, got that idea of element of competition going. But they also got to see... And this is one of the uh, the lovely features of Google Forms is these graphics, right? So they could see, yes, okay, almost half my, my editors thought that my slideshow was effective. And uh, it looks like I still have some work to do because it was only half that thought that that part was effective. So really quickly, they can see if there's something that they need to work on in a, in a, really, in a real way, in a, you know, a pie chart like that. And so, like I said, very simply, you can share that information with them. If, um, if people are interested, I can, we do have some time, and if you wanted to look any more at forms, I could uh, take you on an application share just to show you some of the features if people have questions about forms. Um, so if, if you do, I'm welcome, I'm game for that. Um, otherwise, I just ha wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about collaboration. Um, but okay, so Melanie, if you want, then how about, um, so I'm going to try this quickly with you now. I'll just show you how you could create that form very quickly and what it would look like. So I'm going to give this a shot. Um, sorry, I'm, Elaine, I'm not sure of your question here, what you're, in terms of uh, what scripts you're talking about. Do you want to, do you want to jump on the mic if you're... If you're comfortable. Hi, it's Helena. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I've only seen wizards do this, but and maybe Susan Watt is one of those people. But um, basically, once you create a spreadsheet, like your form goes all together, um, you can write in a script or use a script in order to get it to start sorting. And so I guess what I'm 
I'm not at the level yet where my Google Forms can start to sort so I can see how a student's doing over time rather than just on one Google Form at a time. That's what I was wondering about. Okay, interesting question. So I haven't used them in that way, but that would be fantastic. Like I haven't used it to track one student like that um, over like a number of exercises or time, but I would be interested too. Um, so perhaps that is another session that we could be talking about um, that maybe Susan would have uh, more on for us. So that, yeah, that's an excellent question. Ha ha, yeah, I haven't used them either. Um, I've used scripts, but only scripts that suit my needs. I haven't been in a classroom since scripts and forms were a thing. So, but while um, Christina continues on with her little web tour or application sharing of forms, I'm going to go and look through the OTS uh, past sessions and see if I can find one on using scripts, and I'll share that link if I find it. Thank you, Susan. That's awesome. So I will give this a shot here. Um, so I'm going to show you, and hopefully this is going to cooperate with me. Let me just make sure that I've got my application sharing on. So just bear with me here. It is, here we go. Okay, so I will, I know that Susan has warned me to not go too quickly. So I'm just going to um, click over here. I'm in my um, Google Drive. And just by hovering over New, the only problem with Drive is it's a little, or not Form, sorry, Forms is a little hidden. So you just have to go to the secondary. It's not in the first tier of uh, icons there. So when you scroll over to Google Forms, uh, that's where you just click on Forms, and it will take you to a brand new form. It looks pretty unexciting here, um, uninviting. It's just a blank form, uh, but it will do the trick. And then you can start playing around with how it looks. Uh, this is where you can actually change the background if you wanted to put in your own picture. Uh, Forms itself has a lot of uh, different options, but you can upload your own photo. And hopefully this touring is going well here. Um, but you can, so let's just say we wanted to put in something I'll just throw something in here. Some of them move and have some other capabilities. For example, this baby here is moving in the balloons. So let's say I choose that as my header, but you can change it for your class, your school, your subject. Um, what you, what it's exciting here is that once you start creating questions, you have multiple options. You can do a multiple choice, drop down. You can actually um, use uh, scaling, multiple choice grids. You can do it whether it's a date, time kind of stamped question. Um, with English, I've combined it with paragraph or short answer questions. So if I want them to do more of like a quiz or test here, you can do that. And then once you decide, so for example, multiple choice, quickly you put in, it could be a yes or no. It's also very, uh, it's, it predicts too, once you've put in a question, if it's a yes, no answer. And you can even just accept that they already give you the choices. Um, but here's where, if you're doing a quiz, this is important. Um, Make sure that you've chosen that it's a required question and that the, the type of quiz or type of form it is, is a quiz. So you want to be able to make this a quiz. That's really, really important. And depending on the class uh, or, you know, if pe kids are away, if you're worried about that kind of thing, you may want to do later, that they get the, the release of grade later on. But if you want them to see it right away, you would click on immediate feedback, show them what they've missed, and then um, you can go in, and just to show you, hopefully this is still going well for everybody. Um, when I click on the question now, now you'll see at the bottom, answer key. So what I need to do is assign a point value. So I'm going to give it a point of one. And let's say um, I want to go back and edit the question, because right now it doesn't have a title. But I, if the question was, um, is Romeo a Capulet? And so, now that I've got my question, to assign the right answer, I just click on no. So the answer is wrong here. And then I can add, this is the part that I love, the answer feedback. So if I want to say, um, the, for the incorrect answer, Romeo is actually a Montague. So now when students get the answer wrong, they're going to see what the right answer is right away and know, oh, yeah, that's what I missed. So that is 
going to be great for them because they've learned, they've already gotten the feedback, and now they can move forward with whatever it is that you're doing in class with that knowledge. Um, so that's that's really, that's all that's involved for a simple question. But you have lots of options here. Here's where you can add in a, an image or a link to a video if you want them to watch it. And then you can keep adding questions just by clicking on the plus sign. What's really great is that what you'll love here is the responses um, here. And you can, you'll can you see once responses come in, and there's where you get that link to the spreadsheet. This is where you can get all that information back in a spreadsheet, or you can view it right here on the screen. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in one of my quizzes. So here's my short story quiz. So here it is, responses at the top, 27 responded. And then I can look at it uh, on an individual basis, right? So I can see what, you know, how each student did, um, or I can look at a summary. So if I click on individual, then I can actually click through each student response uh, and see how they did. And this is where I would record my marks as well. Sharing these are super easy. You just click on send, and here's where you have all your different options, um, where either you're clicking usernames, whether you want to send it as an email, or if you want to do it as a link, which is what I do inside my slideshows, um, if you need to shorten that up a bit. I use Bitly all the time because Bitly is, is a lot more personal. So if you're using, if you're um, shortening your links, if you don't know about Bitly, bit.ly, they're personalized, right? So I personalize our link for tonight. But that's just um, one example there. And it's really easy to share out to your, your different platforms. So that's it. That's, I mean, it's that easy to, to use a form and, and you know, you can get really, you know, complex with it. Um, this is just a basic, you know, that was a really quick showing. But, um, you know, and like I said, I use this for discussion. When I started a unit on Brave New World, we got a great discussion from students when they see, you know, for example, society can only exist in family units, or happiness is something that can be controlled. This one really got kids talking because you could see that the class was divided half and half, and then we really got, you know, heated, and that's what I love. And then, you know, it really made the, the study of the novel more meaningful as we actually started getting into the different chapters. So I already had them on board for a lot of this, just by, you know, doing this. And that was simply from, so here are my questions there. And then when you click over to responses, it will show you um, it comes back in, in different graphic form depending on your question. So I'm going to, I think, hopefully that was helpful uh, and that worked. I'm going to try to get out of here really smoothly uh, if I can. So here we go. And we're back. Are we so back? just while you're doing there that, <clears throat> um, I did, I did, I didn't find anything in the OTF Connects list. I think if, if there wasn't a session specifically on scripts, um, however, I did put a link in the chat to something I found when I was Googling, and it's a slideshow, but it lists 10 of the top scripts for education, and there's a little bit of a description of each one there, and I have found, like I've used Formule, as I said, I, I'm not in the classroom anymore, and I haven't been for the last few years, so my use of scripts has been different than classroom teachers, but when I found one like Formule that I wanted to use, I Googled it and found all kinds of YouTube videos. So. Um, the link I put has a great list and an overview, and then if you needed more information, you can Google it yourself probably. But, um, you know, if it's something of interest, I could bring it up to the OTF folks. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, and, um, yeah, so, I mean, it looks like there's a couple of Google tools that we could be uh, talking more about in detail. And, um, you know, with your feedback, I'm happy to do that. And uh, talking more with Susan, uh, that would be great if we can do that for you guys because um, I, I love, you know, I love Google. And uh, to get into certain tools would require, you know, us spending that time just on a few tools. So if that's something you want to share in the feedback, too, with us tonight, that would be great. Uh, I think there's a there's always a feedback at the end, a feedback form. But um, I just want to talk lastly, we've got a few minutes left to talk about collaboration. Um, and again, this is, again, going back to the idea of efficiency, just building it into your slideshows, building it into your lessons. Um, and that's why I love, you know, something as simple as a, a PowerPoint or a Google slideshow is just, it, it's, a, it's a space. It's a space for us to collaborate, and it's, and it's quick to share. So um, especially when the, the topics are, are daunting, right? Uh, and I know, unfortunately, a lot of students don't want to be taking English. Uh, they have to take it. So, um, you know, a lot of the text can seem, you know, difficult. But, you know, I try to get the content to them in, in ways that would, you know, maybe appeal to them more or make more sense. But uh, something as simple as, you know, collaborating online can, can 
really help me to help them and to see where they're at. So I like to use PowerPoint or Google Slides in such an easy way. Um, and I don't ha need to have a lot of devices. So if I had one device every day, I can pass it around. I can have different students putting in answers. Um, and then when I do have those days where, like in my grade 11 U class, we don't have a lot of devices. Um, and funny enough, a lot of kids aren't bringing their own devices. And they think that, you know, bringing a cell phone is a device, which, you know, is another conversation that we have. But um, What's, you know, really important is that, you know, when we do have the opportunity that we, you know, we do it in meaningful ways. We try to get, you know, a lot uh, of ground covered in those days that we have them. So I'm not worried about if they mess something up. And this is after we've talked about netiquette, going back to netiquette. But when, if they mess up content on a slide, it's really easy for me to go back and revision history on Google Slides and just restore my slideshow. So, you know, I don't let them worry about, don't worry about it, because sometimes you're like, oh, somebody changed all the backgrounds, but we can fix it, right? It's always something that can be fixed. And when I don't know the answer, we Google it in my room. Um, I have kids show me shortcuts, and I think that's really important. I'm, I'm really not afraid to make mistakes with the technology, because we can always figure out a way around. Uh, and that is such a valuable moment for learning. So I think, you know, in building that efficiency, it's also important that I'm showing them that I make mistakes and that we make mistakes together and, and not to worry about it. So uh, here's just a really quick activity I could share with you, something that could be done in uh, so many different units, not just in English, but character trading cards, right? Remember, gone are the days I got, I don't know if kids, do kids collect trading cards anymore? I don't know. Uh, but what, uh, I don't know if you have kids at home that trade cards anymore. I'm curious. My daughter's not old enough yet to do that, but we make virtual trading cards for one example to get to know the characters in Romeo and Juliet. So I just give them these very simple instructions, um, and that is, here's a, find an image of your character. I do stipulate it cannot be a movie character. I don't want to see Leonardo DiCaprio as Romeo. We know that. Uh, I want to see something that represents a symbol of him give two to three traits, and give proof from the play. So now I have them engaging with, uh, you know, they're making some inferences, picking something that symbolizes the character, they're learning about the character, they're using the text, and they're using the technology. So we've got it all in a very simple activity. Um, and what's beautiful, too, in Google Slides, I love it, um, is, I don't know if you know this, but very, very simple thing. If you click on Tools and Explore, it takes them right into a safe search. So they will be able to search right within the web uh, or images on in Google Drive, or sorry, Google, uh, or even from their drive. So they can look for existing things that they have already. But it's really, really efficient. It doesn't always have the best pictures. Uh, but you know, they, it's very fast. They just drag and drop the picture into their slide very, very quick. But what I'm excited about is some of the things that they came up with. So I have a sample, a couple samples from last semester. Uh, funny enough, our, our students just did it, uh, well, my, sorry, my students just did it uh, today in class. So I had some other great ones that came out, but I couldn't get them into my slides for, for tonight. But here's an example uh, of, of um, a couple boys in my class who want to talk about Tybalt. Tybalt in the story, if you don't know, is one of the antagonists, and he's very uh, dangerous and hot-headed, but they came up with, this was a slide that they came up with, and I mean, they learned how to create an effective slide, uh, kids got excited sharing this, I could see that they, I could check their understanding very quickly, they've got a trait, they've got the proof, they've got an explanation, they've got a really powerful image here, and their background, you know, uh, is impressive, so that really was, I mean, I did not, they did not need to have a lot of time to do this, but they were engaging, and you only had to have one computer per group uh, because that person would be the one, you know, putting the content in. Everybody else was looking through the, the play to get the content. Um, but then if we had a couple more computers, I did, you know, give as many out as I had for each group. Uh, then they really started playing with font choice, and they, they got really, really into it. Uh, here's one on Juliet, for example. So, you know, Juliet being, and again, I talked about color choice. We do talk about what a good slide would look like uh, because I want them to be able to use these skills in their, in their presentations. So, you know, having consistent color, only three, three to four color choices and that it runs through. So they're learning a lot of skills in just a small activity. And so imagine you could do this with, you know, so many different uh, units. But it was just a simple thing that got them excited about you know, the play, which if they're getting excited about Shakespeare, I'm excited. So uh, they wanted to share them, and that was a win for me. So really, um, at this point, um, 
I just want to finish off, uh, you know, before we have any questions, but just by saying, you know, we want to set them free. We want to, you know, do things in an efficient manner, but I think what we have to keep in mind, just I have a graphic for you here, is that we are not, you know, we start off by modeling, but we're not afraid to make mistakes uh, and, you know, not afraid, you know, not worried about the technology failing on us. You know, there is always a solution, but that we let students be experts, that we provide those templates, and that makes it, you know, something simple for them to copy and build on, you can see that, that my template became amazing in their hands. Um, we allow them to have some kind of online space to collaborate consistently. I think that's most important because the skills will only grow if they have consistent access. And even if it's, like I said, that one computer where we pass it around and have students contribute, or if there's a day or a couple of days where they can have access you know, on a consistent basis. And then lastly, letting them choose. So once they have those, let them choose, let them share, and um, you know, show like this is what works well, and then they can show it off, because then that's going to breed the confidence that we want. We're going to become freer because we can see that the students are free to make um, confident choices in what they're doing in the classroom. So that's really um, what I've taken away from. The more that I'm able to build in for them, the more I'm able to do because I'm able to move around more and work with them, not so much on, you know, they can see the instructions because I've built them into my slides. And so I can work more on being a facilitator and sparking, you know, excitement, listening to their discussions and moving around the classroom. And so it's really freed up a little bit of time for me uh, by using these tools so I can get to what I love to do, which is, you know, teaching them and hearing them. I love hearing how they come up with new and fresh ideas on, you know, content that I've teach, you know, I've taught many, many times. So it's really exciting. I think technology is exciting in that way because we can, we can see new things and their insights, what, what students are, are bringing to the table more and more. So I'm, I will wait here uh, for questions or if there's anything I can maybe tour in the next two to three minutes if somebody wants to see something, perhaps share something that they're doing in their classroom that works well because I'm certainly not the expert here. Uh, this is just what I'm doing, what's working for me. So I would love to hear what other people are doing to inspire uh, you, know, you to walk away with something else here tonight. So um, thank you so much for joining me. And um, I really do invite, we do have a few minutes to chat maybe, uh, but I think Susan will take it from here. So thank you so much for, for joining me. So I'm just going to take a minute and then I'll turn it back to you, Christina. I'm going to put a link into the uh, chat to the feedback survey and I'm going to move ahead a slide but I will also come back again um, and turn it back to you, Christina. Um, but OTF does certainly value your feedback because the feedback helps to drive future programming. It also helps to drive the funding for this program and OTF Connect has been around for I think four years now and it's been growing every year and this year I would say that they, they seem to be, um, there, there seems to be a huge demand that we almost can't meet because of, you know, funding issues. So, you know, the more we can hear from you about what you need, the more that will help all of us. So thank you, all of you, for attending tonight. There was lots of great discussion, great questions, and many of you were, you know, talking amongst yourselves, and we had a couple of you participating on the mic as well. Christina, that was an amazing session. Um, I would say don't sell yourself short. You're certainly the expert in my mind. You know, I, I love to hear uh, about this kind of engagement and creativity happening, particularly in secondary classrooms. So that was very inspiring, and I'm pretty excited to to have been here tonight. So thank you very much to you. I'm going to stop the recording now, and I'm going to put it back to Christina's uh, previous slide in case any of you have any further questions for her. But again, thank you everyone. That was a really great evening.